Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Dr. Gina Senarigi is an author, teacher, sexuality counselor, and certified relationship coach. She's been supporting clean fights and dirty sex in happy, healthy relationships as an educator, coach, consultant, and couples therapist for over 10 years. In Love More, Fight Less, she has authored a relationship workbook for couples who want to learn new skills and build a solid foundation for working through conflicts and move forward in ways that strengthen their bonds. Let's join our producer, Pat Stango, in conversation with Dr. Gina Senarigi. Well, thank you very much, Gina Senarigi, for joining us here on Books Connect Us. Thanks for having uh, me. Of course. So, Gina, could you tell us a little bit about your book, Love More, Fight Less? You know, just a general overview of what readers can expect and uh, why it was important for you to write this book. Yeah. Um, well, I've been a couples therapist and relationship coach for 12 years, and I see folks fall into the same kind of communication traps over and over and over again. And like, I would say at least three quarters of the folks who come into my practice looking for help need some better communication skills. And it's not like they're terrible people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like great people. They love each other really well. Some of them are excellent communicators in their workplaces or in their, with their kids or something. But for some reason, like in that um, romantic partnership, it breaks down and it's so challenging and and or they find themselves in these like patterned kind of like that same fight over and over again or that same kind of dynamic over and over again. It's super frustrating. And I actually started before I was a therapist, I was a teacher and I love creating workbooks and um, worksheets and things. And so um you know, it's one thing to do some re- reflection or to, to go on a retreat or to have a couple's therapy session and to learn some things. It's another to then like walk home and be like, okay, how do we actually implement it? And so I liked using this workbook model to help people actually take action, not just like do the reflection, but change the way that their their communication skills are getting in the way or are problematic and um, and have something that like, because it's a workbook, it's tangible. They can go back to it anytime. So you know, patterns take a while to change. And um, then it's like right there in your hand, right? Like you can just be like, okay, this thing again, let's let's come back to this activity or this reflection. Um, uh, yeah, the, I really like that part of uh, this book that it wasn't just a sort of a prose only or just like sort of a polemic or a big, you know, 200 pages of just instruction. It was a lot of, you know, uh, lesson. And then the couple is supposed to, write down the work that they're doing. It definitely for me made it uh, feel a lot simpler in taking in the information that it was just broken up so well. Um, So why don't you tell us, Gina, what are just some of the big basic common mistakes that you're seeing often in couples that affect their communication? Well, um, you know, it's, it's like, there's a couple of things. The first thing that I often say to folks is that the the patterned behaviors that are problematic in relationships aren't usually um not usually these like giant red flag issues usually we screen those out early on in dating hopefully um and then um but in the long-term relationships when you've been together a long time and you've stuck in these things it's actually our pattern our like patterns that are problematic are made up in these tiny tiny moments right like Um, This moment when I could choose to ask you a question, um, but I avoid it because I read your face as like, oh, he's grumpy, and so I'm going to (laughs) not, right? Or this Mm. tiny moment when um, I just forget to say goodbye to you going out the door. Or this tiny, like there's these tiny ways that, you know, you're not going to make or break a relationship one time leaving the house without saying goodbye or giving a kiss or whatever, but over time, over time, after day, after day, after day, after day, I forget or I, you know, I'm just too busy or whatever, like in all these tiny little ways, they start to accumulate. And so some of what I tried to break down in the book is just these t- like tiny, like micro doses of connection and communication that you can add in to help yourself turn towards each other and help you really remember to turn towards yourself with, towards each other with your best self, kind of like you do when you're first dating 
-hmm. you're like really showing up, totally present. I'm really going to listen. Um, I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to actually like get a little dressed up. I'm going to really shower before I see you or whatever. Like all that little like extra attention that falls away when we're together a long time, we get a little lazy. And um, we do the same thing with our communication. We're like way more attentive and present and careful in how we communicate early on. And so a lot of these practices help you kind of tune up to give that same kind of energy that you might give earlier on in a relationship. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, it does. Well, actually, one of the things I was just reading from your book was you were talking about how uh, it's very common when people first meet a relationship first starts that everyone's very curious about each other and they're asking a lot of questions and they genuinely want to learn about each other. And that sort of diminishes over time in a relationship. You know, people become less curious. They are asking less. So what are, well, first of all, what do you think the, you know, some of the reasons why that happens? And then what are some of the things that you suggest that a couple could work on in order to keep that curiosity going? Yeah. Um, well, curiosity it's so, it's such a, we don't always think about this, but it's like a really critical element to a relationship, um, especially around passion. We hear from people all the time that like passion just wanes the longer you are together, you're less jazzed about each other. And some of that's really like hand in hand with curiosity. The better I get to know you over time, which is part of building a relationship, right? Like I've met your family, I saw where you grew up, I know uh where you keep your underwear and what section of the newspaper you read first right like I, you're familiar to me that's good but mm -hmm. the more of that i build in the less um if there were like scales is kind of the, i'm like going to talk with my hands here for you but there's, like, there's these <laughs> scales right the more on this one side of familiarity and comfort and knowing you the less like mystery intrigue surprise element is there and that's where a lot of the sexiness comes in for most mm -hmm. people right just a little like oh hey you're wearing a different shirt right like and early on everything is mystery and surprise and excitement and um the tricky thing is you want both like you do want to really know your partner it builds a lot of safety and security and trust and stability but we don't want to be too heavy on that end we want to stay curious so that that those scales kind of stay balanced and we don't totally lose the passion. Um, the other part of it is that we like stop being curious about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think I know everything about me already <laughs> and I don't even surprise myself anymore. I'm way less likely to kind of bring that energy to the relationship, right? And so in both senses, my relationship with myself and my relationship with my partner, I want to stay in kind of a learning mindset and just like checking in like, oh, you know, way back when we got together, you said you would never eat at this restaurant or this seafood or whatever. And is that still true for you? Are you still not into it? You would never, you said you'd never go sailing once. I think I remember that. Is that still true? And you might be like, no, I'm totally into that. That's changed or you heard me wrong or I don't know. Like I, you know, like that, that helps us stay actually connected and helps us stay connected while we evolve, right? Like we're changing and growing and learning. Well, yeah, it's your, that was interesting too, that your book actually, it's broken up into all these steps and it seems that the book uh, starts off with the step of doing a lot of self-evaluation, which was an interesting thing to see in a book about relationship communication that the thing that we do forget to do a lot is to think about who we are before we could start working on who we are together. So often the like conflicts that I see are, um, are extra hard to work with uh, are like super rigid or stuck because people get stuck in this place of like pointing fingers blaming like it's very easy to see all the things wrong with our partner right mm -hmm. um but the, the 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 tough truth is we co-create all the dynamics in our like we both signed up for it or contributed in some way not always evenly it's not like a 50 50 right um but we both contribute to it and so if we don't have some sense of awareness of like what are my default patterns is a huge part of what I focus on in the book, getting to know what your kind of default settings are so that you know what you're bringing to the conversation and can own and change your part. Because the truth is, despite our greatest efforts, we usually can't change, a, change our partner. We can give them feedback and hopefully they will do something to change themselves or change the dynamic, but we totally have control over changing our half of the 
the equation. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some folks do really remarkable work changing dynamics in their relationship, even without their present their partner being present, they will just mm -hmm. like really work on themselves and change their own reactions or their own alter their sort of default settings. What, what is a, uh, an example of a sort of, you know, just basic workshop activity that you could suggest people do for that, uh, for that aspect, for continuing to stay in touch with themselves as it relates to their relationship? Yeah. One of the, um, one of the activities that I walk through in the book actually isn't even in the solo section, but individual people can work on it. Um, but I ask folks to think about their conflict flow chart. Like if you mm -hmm. thought about the pattern in your conflict as like a dance, a choreographed dance, I take this step, then you take that step. I take this step and then um, it helps you slow it down a little bit because usually what we do is we don't even realize these quick steps. I said something, then you said something, and then we're both shouting and we don't even realize what happened. <laughs> but if I trace it back, it might be like, I hadn't eaten all day, and then you walked in the door, um, I saw your frown and said, what's up? You said, oh, nothing. And then I said, you never listened to me. Right, <laughs> like track that down, or you don't even care. You're too grumpy. Um, that's how it escalated, right? And if I can yes. look at these steps, then I can start to see ways I can actually interrupt those steps, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe I want to eat something before you come home. Maybe I want to um, greet you differently. Um, maybe I don't want to jump to an assumption that you're always grumpy when you just say nothing's wrong, right? Um, yes. Or maybe I want to ask about your face, right? Like there's a million ways I can start to think about, like I could interrupt that flow chart pretty easily if I slow mm -hmm. myself down and actually draw it out. Yeah, it's so interesting. And also uh, to admit up front or in the middle here, um, you know, I've, I've been married myself for two years in that relationship for almost 10 years. And so much of this definitely felt familiar. Um, and the, this part, especially the conflict conflict dance as you describe it where it's almost where you end up in a pat like like everything else in life you end up in a pattern of this is how we fight um and these are the sort of mistakes we always make um so it's just so interesting to see that laid out that basically couples end up having the same even if it's not about the same subject the same argument over and over again yeah yeah totally well and we don't often look at like if you look at the full flow chart i didn't even give it to you but at the end we talk about like how did we actually resolve it and most of our most of the folks i talk to are like oh well you stormed off and then we both slept on it we never really brought it back up right yes. or we decided it was better not to talk about it or um or like that we saved it for our couples therapy session or whatever yes. right um, and so, and you're saying that's not a good way to resolve it. You just at the <laughs> yeah. end say to have no resolution. We just stop. Yeah, because <laughs> sometimes I, to me, I feel like like oh that that's one that's one way. Yeah. Uh, but you're saying not that. Don't do that. I would say maybe don't totally leave it unresolved. Gotcha, Even gotcha. if you okay, feel resolved, there's a whole section I talk about circling back. So you can. Even if it's resolved for you, you can always like the next day go back to your wife and be like, hey, I feel pretty cl like clean. I feel like I got what I needed. I had to rest and I was probably I was probably tired and a little extra tender last night is why I was so upset. But I feel mm -hmm. good now. Are you good? Is there anything more you need from me to close up that what happened last night? Right. Mm -hmm. And she might be like, no, I'm good, too. Right. That, but at least then you've had that moment to like close it up so mm -hmm. she's not secretly harboring resentment or you're not you know like and right, another right. thing or you know the arguments that come back up right because you didn't yes. resolve it then six months later it's like <laughs> that thing you said back in february here's three more examples of that <laughs> yeah. happening again yeah. yeah yeah and that's some of that like pile up the effect the um mm -hmm. the resentments that build up if we're not so that's another reason why it's like these tiny moments, right? Like, cause that little closure could be so quick. Um, right. if, if it's done with care and what you're saying to your partner in that moment, is like, Hey, I care about you. <laughs> right. Or <laughs> I care about us. Um, and, or I'm sorry, maybe, or, you know, and, um, those are the moments that you move closer together and you like mm -hmm. fortify your relationship foundation. 
um, even more importantly than the times when you have disagreements. The research on relationships says it doesn't really matter how often you disagree, it matters how you disagree and how you resolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and are there, I mean, not to turn this into a therapy session myself, but are there, uh, are there ways in which if someone genuinely would rather just like put this off for now, um, where that could be something that doesn't end up being a total snowball effect, but you also, there are times where I really don't want to have this discussion right at this moment. And is that just a matter of just communicating that in an effective way rather than just like grumbling off? Yeah, well, there are a couple, there's a lot of really good research about interrupting um, like reactivity patterns that says mm -hmm. it's really good to take a break and, and come back once you're both like level-headed, let's say that mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other sections in the book I emphasized was this part thinking about like really what's your intention whenever you speak to your partner. So like anytime we're talking to somebody or around somebody, um, we're looking for some kind of response, <laughs> either <Right>. consciously <laughs> or subconsciously, right? So if I'm walk grumbling past my partner and say like, well, this place is a mess again, um, he could uh, hear that and mm -hmm. get like internally be like, oh, she hates our house or she's mm -hmm. passive aggressively telling me to clean up or she wants to move or she like he could make all kinds of guesses mm -hmm. as to what I'm saying um, because I'm not being clear. Like, why am I just grumbling this thing out loud near her? Right. right. Or um, I could be more clear about like, hey, can you help me clean up? Or um, I'm really tired and I just want someone to empathize with our kids leave our stuff all over the house, right? I just want you mm -hmm. to be like, it is a bummer having to pick this stuff up every night, <laughs> right? Right, right. <laughs> or maybe um, I want to problem solve and I want you to like help me figure out, can we organize our closet differently? So um, I clearly have two small children. Um, so <laughs> like the toys get put away at the end of the day, right? But either any of those, that if I can be more clear about my intention in mm -hmm. saying it and what I want for my partner, he's way more likely to be able to show up and be like, yeah, I can problem solve and build a shelf for a closet or uh, right. yeah, I can tell you like it sucks to have to clean stuff up all the time. Um, and the same thing on his end, he can ask me like if, when I'm grumbling around the house, he could say like, hey, um, you know, you said that, do you want me to help you clean up do, or do you want me just to like, you know, remind you how what an amazing co-parent and mom you are right now. Validation, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. <laughs> Do you need a hug? Do you need some affection? Um, right, like, so he could offer me different ideas, like, to help clarify what's my intention. There's a whole right, section about right. that in the book to help us get clearer. Um, and then that, that closes a huge gap, right? Because he could get up and start organizing the closet. I, this I see all the time. And I, oh. you're going to resonate with this and everyone who's listening will resonate. But like you can get up and try and act with love. And like, let's say you, you're like, oh, she needs me to help organize the closet. And I'm like, no, I just need a hug. And you didn't uh -huh, tell me I'm uh -huh. a great mom. Right. <laughs> and so I'll be like, you, you know, like then cut to five years later, you're in my office for couples therapy. And I'm saying, you don't tell me you love me. And you're like, I organized the closet. And I but, but like you have a laundry list of the things you've done to show me love, but they we just haven't quite met because we weren't clear about what's the kind of love I need to be shown and how are you doing it? You know that, right? right? Like you hear that from friends, wanna... right? They're like, I'm spinning my wheels. I'm putting all this effort into this relationship. And she tells me she's not feeling loved or he tells me, you know, I don't appreciate him. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Right. Right, right. And it's just people either want signs of love in different ways or give it in different ways. And if those don't match up, then people aren't realizing it. Yeah. So and also in an example like that, uh, one of the ways it seems that people could respond incorrectly is you talk about how people often comes, come up with like the worst case scenarios in their head when they are confronted with a problem where they almost imagine the, is this true? Like they sort of imagine the fight itself or imagine like the worst possible response from their partner before they even communicate. Yeah, um, we are far less likely to give a generous interpretation. We're like, we're hardwired. And especially I would even say right now, 
we're in a pandemic. People are pretty stressed out and um, there's like a chronic high level of stress happening for most people, um, which you know, in our brains turns on sort of a trauma response that says like, oh no, <laughs> to almost anything, even if it's potentially a good surprise or potentially like mm -hmm. good things happening. Um, we're just not very relaxed right now. And the more, <laughs> the more in general we are in a relaxed and like very trustworthy, very safe and stable place, the more generous we can be. But by mm -hmm. default, it's a protective factor, right? Like, oh no, what does that mean? I'm going to fill in with like, is he leaving me? Is he sick? Or is she going to run away? Or is she cheating on me? Whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really important to find ways to interrupt that part and either check it out or slow it down or kind of train yourself to give more generous interpretations. I think there's mm -hmm. a section on that in the book too. And is, is jealousy often the... Uh, one of the cases where that happens the most, where people come up with worst case scenarios when they feel some kind of jealousy. Like, you know, my partner is maybe a little too good of friends with someone at the office that, you know, they're always telling me something funny so-and-so said today. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, gosh, I love working with jealousy and insecurity in relationships. It's some of my favorite stuff. <laughs> but um, I think that a lot of times when jealousy is present, it's really easy to like over focus on stuff that we're seeing and and like you said like we create a narrative we create a story about it that's likely not just going to serve us and not going to serve our partnership very well mm -hmm. um but in some way it's like it's just like one of our most misguided parts of ourself and so um i ask folks to sit with their jealousy a little bit and figure out what it's kind of trying to tell you because it's misguided, right? So my jealousy might be like, mm, my partner's talking to that person um, and she is really gorgeous and she's laughing a whole lot at everything he says. I'm like, oh, I don't ever want him to talk to that person. <laughs> That's what my jealousy right. would say. But is that really true? Like in my, tr in the truest sense of myself, do I really want him to not talk to people? No, I want him to like mm -hmm. talk to people and have laughter in his life. <laughs> you know, like right. that's, that's like the grounded part of my mind. So I sit with my jealous parts. Maybe, you know, he and I haven't had much laughter that day. Maybe we've been bickering or maybe I haven't felt as close to him or maybe I think that woman's a babe and I wish she was laughing with me or mm -hmm. or whatever right like the, there's so much more that could be going on and those things tell me like oh I want more laughter in my relationship oh I want to flirt with him at this party oh I like okay I'll right. go get what I want um but like focusing it on her and jealousy and whatever about that isn't actually going to get me there so what is what are um, you know someone's going through that you know problem in their relationship feeling jealousy whether it's founded or unfounded? What is a, a suggestion for uh, like a daily activity you think someone could do to to work through that to think through that logically to deal with it? Well, um, I think the first thing I would do is name it with a partner so that you know is there is there anything founded or unfounded mm -hmm. right and that's. Um, and odds are pretty good. Most of our jealousy tends to be unfounded, mm -hmm. truthfully. Um, but so let's say it is, right? I think often like the person who's feeling the jealousy will feel really insecure about it and have like feel bad about the fact that they feel jealous. There's like a double negative there. It, or, and the person who, um, is like receiving that the other partner will feel like a little defensive like what did i do and why would you feel this way i'm an honest guy or i'm a i'm not doing anything <laughs> right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so um again i think that goes back to that this whole first section about your default patterns and really understanding like how do you receive feedback from a partner or talk about uncomfortable things or n like do vulnerability in relationships vulnerability being saying I feel insecure when you talk to your coworker and I don't know what that's mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. um, but I got to check it out with you, right? Because when we get defensive, we're not going to, it's going to be very hard for us to work together. And so mm -hmm. if you know what your default like defense pa patterns are, you're going to be able to take care of them better and then come back to your partner ready to be clear about what you want and need and really connect with each other more right. meaningfully. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting after reading through this book just how much of meaningful and positive communication comes down to understanding the things that you do all the time and the way that you just operate yourself and like just recognizing that. Yeah. Um, recognizing so one, it and not like over over identifying with it too. Because mm-hmm, so often mm-hmm. when we recognize our patterns, we're like, oh, I'm a total jerk or, uh, you know, like I'll never be loved or what, like we'll just like go to these like terrible stories about ourselves instead of like, oh, I, pr- I didn't get taught how to do love very well in my family or in my mm-hmm. first relationships or by this culture, right? Like taught me some kind of messed up stuff about relationships. It's not how I want to do it. I need more practice, right? Like way right. more self-compassionate approach than I'm terrible and will never, I'm bad at relationships or I have trust issues or something, you know? Right. And then almost using that as an, as an excuse. Yeah. 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 Um, so though, uh, one last thing I want to talk about is, uh, the topic of what you call unresolvable conflicts, which to me kind of seems like a little bit of, there are things about each other that we have to learn to accept. Um, so yeah, could you talk about what are unresolvable conflicts and how could we deal with things that we're not, that can't be resolved? Yeah. Well, um, one of the best known researchers in couples work, the the Gottmans, um, John Gottman um, and Julie Gottman, have done a ton of research on the kinds of conflicts that come up in relationships. And they call one of them unresolvable or perpetual conflicts. That's kind of what we're talking about. Um, Dan Savage, another podcaster about relationships, he calls it the price of admission. <laughs> that, um, you know, I think his example was like his partner leaves uh, will like leave a sandwich on the counter maybe or something like that and it drives him crazy um, but over time he's just realized like that is not something that's going to change about this partner and that is just part of the deal of being with him I have to decide am I is this sandwich worth having huge conflict over or breaking up with this guy or coming back to it over and over again mm-hmm. or can I like breathe and let it go right mm-hmm. um, and For every partnership, it's a little bit different what actually like counts as unresolvable. For some people, that sandwich on the counter thing would be like a really hard boundary. I cannot live with somebody who leaves food out or something like that, right? Um, Or I cannot um, be uh, with somebody who parents in this really different way. But the more like rigid we are with a lot of things, the harder it's going to be to actually work with somebody and be creative and problem solving and figure things out um, together. You know, one I see a lot is there's always a get there early partner and there's always a whatever, like they may not even be late, but like on time or not as early as that person, right? The one of you wants to get to the airport two hours before the flight. One of you wants to get there four hours or one of you wants Mm -hmm. to get there 15 minutes before the flight or whatever, right? right, right. right? Every couple that I work with has somebody and every, like the spectrum of what is late and on time is different. It's, it's right. different based on interpretation. Right. So should those couples just meet each other on the plane? <laughs> right. The seats? I mean, that's one way they could work it out, right? <laughs> one of them goes <laughs> early and checks all the bags and then the other one shows up with it on, in a different Uber or something. Um, right, right. <laughs> Or they trade off or, I mean, I could come up with lots of ways that they might be able to work through that, but you can hear how the more rigid you are about it, the less like creative you can be, the less likely you're going to find a partner that's going to align perfectly with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically in the end, there's a few things we have to accept. We've got to just chalk them up as, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm looking the other way on this as long as it's something at the level of uh, a half-eaten sandwich on the counter once in a while. Yeah, well, you have to decide what your things are, right, that you mm-hmm. can live with. There, I mean, um, I've had clients who have said um, infidelity is something I would never, ever live with or repair. And I've, I've also seen tons of couples who said that before and then have repaired after infidelity, right? Like, right, or right. I've, and I've seen some folks who... Um, have different views about having children, which is a really big lifelong decision, right? And um, Mm -hmm. figure out creative and different ways to get to parenting. Um, And some who've 
decided to split because they want really mm -hmm. different things. So mm -hmm. you've got to figure out what your sandwich is. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how was the, uh, you know, last thing is, is uh, you have obviously done this as your career for, for a long time and worked with these couples in person, but how was the process for you of actually getting down all the things you've talked about and learned over the years into a book? Was this, uh, was it a daunting process or did you feel like you yourself learned a lot by actually putting these down on paper in a way that maybe you didn't as often when you were doing it in person all the time? Well, you know, I love, I, I mentioned this earlier, I've been making worksheets and workbooks for years for my clients. Um, and I have a blog and I have a website where I've been doing a ton of writing for a long time now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some of how um, the folks at Penguin Random House found me. But the um, but it was so wonderful for me to have an editing team to work with because it's like, especially in um, private practice as a therapist, you really work in a silo a lot. There's supervision about your practice, but nobody tells you how to write anything or how to like mm -hmm. cultivate your thoughts in an organized manner. And, <laughs> and so I, I felt really grateful the whole time to have the support of actual professionals in the field of, um, writing and publishing that, um, could help me out a lot. So I had, I, frankly, I had pieces of the materials all together. Um, but I'd never had a team around me who could help me like make sense of it <laughs> really in a, in a very clear way. Um, and I really loved that process. It was really quick ultimately because, um, I had so much of it, um, ready. I did it over the holidays and then was done in March. So, um, it was a pretty quick turnaround, but I could turn it around like that also because I had this great team there. It was wonderful. Well, congratulations. Yeah, the, the book is really great. And I think it's going to help a lot of people out. I'm hearing that. From uh, is a there lot anything? Of people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, that is, uh, it, it's, it seems, it seems very actionable and very practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's what I was aiming for. So I'm glad, I'm glad that they did it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you, uh, Gina Senarigi, the author of Love More, Fight Less. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.